<laughs> so um, thank you for this opportunity to talk about my work. I'd like to begin by explaining my title. So in the short time that I have to talk to you this evening, um, I can only give you the condensed version of my research and its findings, the brief traveler's guide, if you will, to the significance of Roman foot and shoe shaped artifacts. So this is what I'm going to talk about this evening. I'm going to give a little bit of background to actual Roman footwear and Roman hobnailing. I'll go quickly through my theoretical approaches. I'll talk about my research sample and my data collection, uh, the geographical and chronological distribution of the foot-shaped artifacts, what types of site they were found in, and the recurring strands of significance, as I like to call them, that I found, and then discuss my artifacts in a little bit more detail. So in order to understand foot and shoe shaped artifact, it helps to know a little bit about actual Roman footwear. Roman shoemaking technologies brought a huge number of styles and footwear fashion carried associations of prestige and was a marker for personal identity. Carol Fandriel Murray found that Roman footwear fashions can be dated and this is her diagram of changes in Roman footwear style through the imperial period with the earliest top left and the later ones bottom right. Like us, the Romans wore formal shoes for official occasions, showing their rank through the style of boots that they wore with their togas. Please note, not sandals, it was boots with togas. And appropriate footwear was very important, at least to the Roman authors. Fashionable smart shoes were worn for less formal occasions and showed socioeconomic status through ornamentation. This shoe is from the collection at Vindelander and it would have been quite expensive because of the holes in it. Um, obviously, if it had been plain leather, it would have involved much less labour, much less work than one with that number of holes. And the holes would have been there to demo to show off the brightly coloured sock or lining inside the shoe. Sandals or soli were worn for less formal events as well. And they're like our flip flops. They were a sign of a femininity. They were a woman's shoe. And they also displayed fashion and socioeconomic status. And this one, which is also from Vindelanda, is known as Lepidina's slipper. And it contains what may be one of the first um, designer labels in history just there there's a stamp on the leather with the maker's name on it because leather only survives archaeologically under certain conditions most of the evidence we have for footwear comes from hobnails these were used in shoe construction but also as direct as decorative embellishments on shoe soles and i'll talk about some of the symbolism later roman hobnailing patterns follow trends and many artifacts include depictions of hobnailing, even though these were not always visible during use. Some look like real nailing patterns, as you can see, and others are more creative. Um, influenced by the popularity of attractive hobnailing patterns, artifact makers may have mimicked the hobnailing to attract customers and to demonstrate their skills as craftspeople. But as you'll see as we go on, there are more deep meanings than that. So um, my sample, um, I studied 18,465 Roman burials with evidence of actual footwear and the contents of 1,311 Roman wells, 325 of which had evidence of deposited shoes because it's important to establish the social significance of actual shoes before you can consider their representations. I also assembled a corpus of 1,319 representations of feet and footwear over 12 categories. These are my categories. And I approached these as a series of case studies. So there was a case study on statue of foot fragments broken off statues uh, a case study on lamps in the shape of feet, a case study on sandal brooches. Um, the blue section represents a case study that I did, it was called 
footprints. So it included calf footprints, footprints in CBM, stamp CBM and seal stamps or stamp matrices. And then another case study, which I called miscellaneous because that's what it was. It was all the other shoe shaped artifacts, foot and shoe shaped artifacts that I had to put somewhere. Um, my theoretical approach is I regard archeological theory as a toolkit, applying it where appropriate, theoretical bricolage rather than purism. A number of theoretical approaches proved useful in analyzing my data. Since my research focuses on the Northwestern provinces, I naturally had to take post-colonial theory into account. Object biography was a particularly useful theory when considering the significance of footwear deposited in Roman wells, but also for interpreting the meaning of some foot-shaped artifacts, since it provides a method to reveal the relationships between people and objects. I wrestled with concepts of object agency, eventually concluding that since objects used as ex votos were perceived as having an influence on the gods and apotropaic items were regarded as having a protective effect, this could be regarded as object agency. I also con considered entanglement since the idea of humans and things being entangled or enmeshed provides a more nuanced solution to the object agency debate. Perhaps the most useful theory for my research was contextual archaeology. Hodder explains that the first stage of this analytical procedure is to identify the network of patterned similarities and differences in relation to the object being examined and the questions being asked. This is a matter of taking the four dimensions of variation available to archaeologists, the temporal, spatial, depositional and typological. And this fed into how I recorded and analysed my data. So I collected my data from many types of published source and I identified unpublished foot shaped artefacts by contacting museums with Roman collections and through internet searches. I obtained some data for some of the artefacts through social media. For example, this foot shaped lamp from Caution popped up on my Twitter feed one day and I uh, emailed Wiltshire Museum where it is to ask them for the details, which they kindly provided. And this foot shaped lamp was published on Facebook in 2019. It's from a burial at the Rue Königshofen in Strasbourg. And these data from modern media should help to counterbalance the many antiquarian reports I've had to deal with. Of course, no survey of this kind of material can ever hope to be complete. I have come across a few more foot-shaped artefacts since I finished my data collection in February. But hopefully, my approach has ensured that the samples are as representative as possible. I used Microsoft Access to record the details of my corpus. It allows you to include pictures in the database and you can perform queries. And I found it very helpful for spotting patterns and for my data analysis. So I'd like to have a look at the geographical uh, de distribution of my artifacts. These are the ones where we know where they came from. It's not all of them, as you can see. And it shows how widely spread they are. They go from all the way up on the Antonine Wall, up there in Scotland, right the way down to Egypt, down the Nile, and all the way from the east, Turkey and Syria, and all the way across to the west and right around the, the Mediterranean. So pretty widespread. This map shows their spread across the northwestern provinces. And of the 1,319 objects in my corpus, 696, that's 53%, more than half, were found in the northwestern provinces, with a further 130, that's 10%, coming from the Danube region along the Limes. This chart shows the overall date range of the sample, peaking from the first to the third centuries AD. But this is, however, an oversimplification because the date range tends to vary for different objects. If you have a look at this, the red line is lamps in the shape of feet, which peak in the first century and again in the fourth. Sandal fibulae, the sort of orangey yellow peak, 
are predominantly second century, while jugs where the handle terminates in feet are principally from the third century. That's the dotty green line there. And knife or razor handles ending in a foot are mostly late third and early fourth century. So as you can see, there is some variation of when those objects are more popular. I looked at the types of site where the artifacts were found, which I decided to call fine settings to avoid the ambiguity of the word context in archaeology. Um, this information is not recorded for all artifacts, especially those on the Portable Antiquities Scheme database. In fact, only 750 foot-shaped artifacts in my corpus, and that's just 57%, have a known fine setting. My categories, as you can see, are funerary, uh, that's burials and cemeteries, military, which can be forts, camps, mile castles, religious artifacts from temples, sanctuaries, shrines and lararia, urban, that's quite a nebulous category and covers anything from, you know, quite big cities to small towns, villa slash rural, um, the category is biased towards villas, which have received more attention than other rural settlements. I've got one called water, which covers objects that have been deposited in wells, rivers and bogs. I have a category called other, which covers anything that's not already covered and includes things like a port, potteries, a rubbish dump and the largest category, which is called unknown. And this is due to the lack of adequate recording and in reporting. So there are inherent problems in classifying fine settings, since the categories tend to be very broad and lump sites together. It can, however, be necessary to generalise categories of fine setting to create sufficiently large numbers in order to gain a representative sample. Sometimes more than one category might be applicable to an artefact. For example, there's a jug from the sanctuary of Apollo in Grand Vosges that was found in the well. And we'll see a picture of it later. And I could have classified that either as religious or as water. In the end, I plumped for water. Um, and different types of artifacts come from slightly different sites, as this chart shows. So uh, a lot of the brooches are urban. Um, and a lot, a lot of the lamps are funerary. So it's, it's interesting to see what, what goes where. My data analysis showed up some recurring themes or strands of significance, which I will talk to you about now. Leather shoes take on the shape of the wearer's foot. They also leave footprints as evidence where the, of where the wearer has been. Roman shoes and footprints can therefore stand for a whole being, be they human or divine. A footwear type can help to identify the being represented. Bare feet in Roman art often signify a deity or a hero. Soli I flip flop like sandals often denote a goddess. These expensive Roman carved footprints represent a presence, usually in a temple. Footprints in Roman CBM show that someone of less exalted status was there. And Roman stamp matrices are often made in the shape of feet. Footprints can be signatures, so they can also be a sign of ownership and authority. And the idea of the foot as a symbol of power can be seen in ancient literature, especially in accounts of emperors. For example, these quotes from the life of Provus from the Historia Augusta, and I'll leave you to read those. The idea is also illustrated by Roman statues showing an armed emperor in elaborate boots with his foot on or next to a captured non-Roman. For example, these statues of Hadrian and I'm indebted to Carol Radato for the photographs. Examples of Roman magistrates seat the curule chair have been found with attachment in the shape of human feet. And here's an example from the Netherlands. <sighs> S 
some Roman deities are associated with artifacts in the shape of feet. Serapis is often symbolized by feet, sometimes bare, and sometimes in crepidae. That's a kind of sandal worn in portraits of philosophers or healers. Isis is also frequently represented by feet. Here's a lamp that's dedicated to her. Mercury is shown by winged sandals and shoe brooches may also be his symbols. One was found in the Walbrook in London with a miniature caduceus. Eleven of foot lamps in my corpus have vine leaves for handles, a symbol of Bacchus, and 14 others might once have had such handles, but these have since broken off. 17 of them also feature a scallop shell, which is another Bacchic symbol often seen on lead sarcophagi. And these deities all have roles to do with death and the afterlife. Other deities represented by feet include Mithras, Diana, Nemesis, Juno and Mars. Later Roman foot-shaped artefacts feature Christian symbols such as Cairo, a cross or Alpha and Omega like this perfume bottle. This seems appropriate as there are many references to feet and sandals in the Bible. And Christ also has a role to do with death and the afterlife. Roman feet and footwear performed an apotropaic role. Actual shoes protect feet physically from dirt, damp, cold, thorns, snake bite and other harms, and by extension, protect metaphorically against evil influences, particularly on journeys, whether actual, the journey of life, or the journey to the underworld. Ancient texts attest to Roman beliefs about luck involving feet and shoes. Here's an example of the foot being used to wish good luck. It comes from Horace's second epistle, E pere Fausto, which Loeb translates as go good luck to you, but it literally means go with your lucky foot. Um, as you can see, there are some hobnailing patterns there. They include hob, um, apotropaic symbols. So the top one, it's got a symbol that looks like an eye and it's sought to avert the evil eye. The middle one features Neptune's trident and the deity symbol may have strengthened the apotropaic effect by adding the God's protection. And the bottom one features a swastika, which is a very unfortunate symbol nowadays, but the Sanskrit word means well-being, good luck, good fortune, and that's what it would have meant to the Romans. The apotropaic use of Roman representations of footwear can be most clearly seen on foot-shaped amulets, and here are a few examples from my corpus. The Roman charm in the form of a golden boot came from Italy and is now in the British Museum. It dates to the first or second century AD, is only two centimetres tall and has a message marked out in hobnails on the sole in Greek that means be trodden on. Um, and that would have given the amulet more potency because treading on something, trampling on something is a sign of having power over it. The amulet in the middle is a right footed copper alloy amulet found in Tongeren. It's got a bare foot, which could mean it represents a deity enhancing its magical effects. And the gold plated amuletic ring from Pomeroy in Belgium features the apotropate use of Roman hobnailing again. Um, ancient authors often wrote about Greco-Roman beliefs that the right was auspicious and the left not. We might therefore expect there to be no left feet in my corpus. However, this is not the case. Um, the inclusion of left feet may be linked to the persistence of local beliefs or to some form of resistance. It could also indicate the contractual use of left and right shoes proposed by Carol Fandriel Murray. She suggests that a left shoe was deposited in a well, while the right was retained as a reminder of the vow. It is also possible that, as in ancient Greece, the left side symbolised movement or reflected the feminine as found in the Hippocratic treatises, bringing healing and restorative qualities. It may also be that the chirality is not so important 
and that a foot or shoe shape is lucky enough. And we find that different artifact types have different ratios of left and right, as this chart shows. So if you have a look at the one for lamps, vastly most of them are right feet. With the shoe brooches, it's more or less the same, but there are more left than right. Um, the seal stamps, again, more right than left. Statue fragments, the dark blue signifies pairs. There's quite a lot of pairs. Um, so perhaps because of these recurring strands of significance, Roman footwear crops up in different ritual situations. 88 Roman representations of feet in my study were found in religious sites such as temples or shrines. They constitute offerings to the gods or symbols of the presence of a deity or a worshipper or both. And here are some examples. This lamp was found in Pompeii. It's in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. And it was part of a set from a Lerarium niche in the house of Caprasius Felix. And these votive footprints are from a shrine to Nemesis in the amphitheater at Italica in Spain. Footwear is also commonly used in Roman funerary settings. I studied 18,465 Roman burials containing evidence of real footwear. This map shows the spread of some of them in Britain. Shoes could be worn by the deceased or placed beside them. Now this is a third century woman's burial from, from Bonneuil en France, where five shoes, which is a very odd number for footwear, were tucked down by the deceased's right hip. So sort of there. And there's only one pair there. Uh, the footwear may have provided protection for the journey to the underworld or represented the deceased's family or both. Miniature artifacts like this tiny double lamp found in Egypt were made especially for tombs. Copper alloy goods like this lamp also showed wealth and status. Of my studies, 750 shoe-shaped artifacts with a known fine setting 100 came, that's 13%, came from burials. There are many possible reasons for their use in graves. They may have been part of burial rites, brought protection on the final journey, have been chosen to show wealth and status, represented the deceased family, or all of those and more. Real footwear is sometimes found deposited in Roman wells. Coventina's well on Hadrian's Wall is one example. I studied 1,311 Roman wells, finding evidence in 325 of them of deposited shoes. Now, shoe deposits in wells can be just rubbish, but they can also mark events in the biography of a well. For example, this boy's sandal was found at the bottom of the well at Dalton Parlours in Yorkshire. The style dates it to 100 years before the closure of the well. And it's been interpreted as a ritual marker for the construction stage in the, felt, in the well's life cycle. Further leather examples come from the wells at Katwijk in the Netherlands and Erpskwerps in Belgium. A set of hobnails was found behind the lining of well five at Lower Slaughter in Gloucestershire. And a well at Fenray in the Netherlands contained two shoes, one at the top and one at the bottom. The one at the bottom marked commencement of the well and the other one, its closure. Shoes deposited in wells may also mark a contract with the deity, as I explained earlier. This left shoe from well 79 at the Zalborg foot on the Limes is thought to be an example of this. Worn shoes were particularly appropriate for this as they retain the imprint of the wearer's soul and a bit of their essence, if you like. Foot-shaped artifacts were deposited in wells for similar reasons. So of two here, and the, the picture of the jug is that one from the sanctuary, the well in the sanctuary of Apollo that I talked about earlier. So,
footwear also gets deposited in votedly in rivers, for example, um, in the Tees at Pierce Bridge. And this is also true for some artifacts. This knife or razor handle with a foot on it was also found in the Tees at Pierce Bridge. Um, this is the brooch from the Walbrook in London that was found with a caduceus. 19 Roman jugs ending in feet in my corpus were found in rivers and other wet places. For example, four in the Sound, two in the Rhine, three in the Danube, and one in marshland by the Somme. And this copper alloy foot and lower leg, thought to come from an equestrian statue, was found deposited in a peat bog in Milsington in Scotland with other copper alloy objects. Clearly then, Roman shoes and representations of feet and footwear were considered appropriate votive offerings. So, now that we've looked briefly at my overall findings, I'd like to talk a bit more in detail about my artefact case studies. First of all, I looked at the significance of Roman footprints, actual footprints preserved in ceramic building materials, many of them with hobnails, and representations of footprints occur across the Roman world. My case study included footprints carved in stone or vestigia, often from a sanctuary, Stamp matrices used as a maker or owner's mark, CBM stamped with a planter pedis, and actual footprints made in CBM. My corpus of vestigia comprises 66 examples. I had to use a different classification of fine setting for these artifacts as they were found in very specific building types, as this chart shows. The car footprints represent the presence of a deity, a worshipper, a pilgrim and the direction of the footprints may be an indication of who is represented. There is a theory which says if they point up, they represent the worshipper, and if they point down, they represent the deity, but that's not consistent. The vestigia are also votive offerings made to a deity in thanks for service or in fulfilment of a vow. And again, the type of footwear is a clue to whose feet they are. For example, the sandals in the middle belong to Isis, the sand indicator goddess, and the ones in the footprint bottom right uh, represent Kylestis. Stamp matrices demonstrate the use of footprints as signatures as a kind of past toto for the owner or user. My corpus runs to 158 examples, most of them copper alloy, but three are ceramic. Unfortunately, the fine setting of 127 stamp matrices is unrecorded, so this piece of data was mostly unhelpful. However, the inscriptions on the stamp matrices help with the interpretation of their significance. This chart shows the kind of inscriptions or symbols on the stamp. If you have a look, obviously the majority are names, which is what you'd expect from that kind of seal stamp. Some of them are religious, some of them wish good luck, some of them express a quality. And um, here are some examples of some religious ones. So we've got in Deo, in God, which may be a contraction of space in Deo that also exists. Uh, then we've got Vivas with a Cairo or Christogram, it's a Christian symbol. We've got one that says Ice Theos, which is Greek for one God. It may not be the Greco. Oh, sorry, the Judeo-Christian God, it may be Serapis or some other God. And the one bottom right has a cross on the handle. The owner was a Christian. And then here are some apotropaic inscriptions. So we've got Utuxi, good luck, in Greek. Utere Felix, use with luck. This is a fairly common um, is inscription on things like military belts and other kinds of jewellery. And the bottom one says Zoe Higia, life and health, which is a similar thing to good luck for the Romans. And the footprint frame can add an apotropaic dimension because of the protective value of feet and footwear. Some CBM, especially of a military origin, stamped with plantipedis as a kind of signature, a sign of power, 
and an apotropaic symbol alongside the inclusion of hobnailing. And here are some examples. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the one top right where there's an ivy leaf and that ivy leaf is a symbol of ISIS. Actual footprints in CBN might be the most controversial aspect of my case study. I looked forensically at how clear the footprints were, whether there was any blurring that indicated movement. So if you have a look, top left there's one from Vaison La Romaine where a little toddler just ran across the tile as it was drying. Um, so that's, that's kind of an accidental one. This one from Roman, from the Roman villa at Brading. Um, it, the, the footprints are a bit muddled, like somebody's been stomping around. But if you have a look at the rest of them, the footprints are actually quite clear. And they've been, I think, deliber deliberately placed. So this chart shows the clarity of the 121 pieces of CBM in my corpus. 71% um, of them are sharp, that is not moving. Additionally, some of the footprints were made by people wearing their fashionably nailed shoes, like this one here, if you can see, there's a sort of S pattern in it. And you would have expected um, the people who produced the CBM to wear either much more heavily nailed shoes or not, no shoes at all. So I think these footprints, the sharp ones, should be interpreted as having been made deliberately. This may be a way of commemorating the presence of someone, even if that is just a naughty child. Footprints also act as a signature to show the maker's involvement in prestigious buildings. Many footprints appear on Teguli and the roof was a liminal space in need of protection. It is therefore possible that the footprints were apotropaic symbols to keep bad luck away from the buildings or from the makers themselves. A case in point is this tile, uh, bottom right, from the Temple of Victory in Pietra Bondante. The footprints were made by two female slaves or ex-slaves, and they signed them in Oscan and Latin. And this personalization of this tile placed their representation high up in the temple, nearer to the goddess. My next case study, I considered why feet separated from Roman sculpture or broken off from Roman sculpture may have been preserved rather than being recycled. The data for this case study came from the CSIR Great Britain series, including some as yet unpublished sculpture that Lindsay Allison Jones kindly gave me details for. Obviously, my sample could have been much larger and from a much greater geographical area, but I did this piece of research in a time of COVID when the libraries and museums were closed and it was hard enough getting hold of the books from Great Britain. However, CSIR Great Britain did provide data for 1,064 humanoid statues of which 75 were foot fragments. I examined whether the foot fragments fitted into patterns of symbolism observed in other Roman foot-shaped artifacts, symbols of whole individual, feet and foot were as symbols of deities, ritual or apotropaic objects, or symbols of authority and domination? The short answer is yes, but not as clearly as those artifacts that were originally made in the shape of feet alone. And this chart shows whose feet are represented in my 75 foot fragments. So as you can see, uh, the frequency of the deities varies and the most commonly represented are people, and all of those people's, all those sets of people's feet come from grave markers. The working title for my next case study was Miscellaneous because it covers a range of different foot shaped artifacts and it aimed to establish how ubiquitous these were. As well as researching amulets and finger rings, which we saw earlier, I put together a corpus of 76. Roman jugs whose handles end in feet. 23 of the jugs are represented by just the handle, which were soldered on and they come off quite easily. There is only one ceramic example that I found and the others are copper alloy. They date from the late first to the third centuries AD 
and range in height from 22 to 32 centimetres. The jugs come in two slightly different shapes, usually classified as Western, that's this one, which are tall and slender with an extended cylindrical lower body, and Eastern, where the body is ovoid. The names are a little bit misleading, as some of the Eastern type are found in Spain and France, while the Western ones come from Hungary, Bosnia, some of them come from Bosnia, Hungary, Romania. 53 of the jugs depict bare feet, while 17 wear sandals of a type seen on portraits of goddesses. The jugs were of ritual significance, being deposited in funerary and sanctuary settings, and as votives, many of them in water, possibly because the depictions of feet represent deities. According to Martin Millet, Religious symbols are common on objects found in hoards, and nine of the foot-handled jugs formed part of hoards, some containing coins, and some in caches of copper alloy items. Another artifact type I looked at is knife or razor handles, and nobody's quite sure which, in the shape of feet. I catalogued 31, all but four of them, that's these four from Britain. Two bone or ivory handles were found in Ostia, one of which is just a foot, while the other is similar to the British copper alloy handles. The other exceptions were found in Germany, one in Schwertzheim and one in Cologne. The foot length varies between 10 and 24 millimetres, with an average of 18.7 millimetres. The dating of these objects is uncertain, apart from four that were found in context from the late 3rd and early 4th centuries. However, since 22 of the 31 handles in my corpus are wearing the same style of sandals over socks, yep, socks with sandals, as the datable examples, which I've highlighted, it seems likely that this date range fits these particular handles. There may be novelty forms like knife handles featuring hunting, gladiators and erotic scenes. However, knife handles in the form of busts of Minerva are also known which supports an argument for religious symbolism. The foot handles are polysemous, ranging in significance from a representation of fashionable footwear to being used as votive objects in religious settings. There are 54 sets of furniture feet actually in the shape of human feet in my corpus. Originally, they would have been in sets, obviously, depending on the kind of furniture, three or four, but some have lost com components over time. According to Lewis and Short, the Latin word for foot, pays, was also used for furniture attachments, so there may just be um, a physical embodiment of a pun. Some sets are from folding stools or coralie chairs and symbolise power and authority. Seven sets were found in high status burials, so they were considered appropriate grave goods, again, feet and shoes in burials, as well as being fun. Furniture attachments in the form of human feet can signify power, wealth, status, and provide some protection. Um, 22 foot and shoe shaped flasks that may have held oil also feature in my corpus. They are mostly copper alloy, but one is ceramic and two are glass. 17 of them feature hobnailed soles. Less than half of them come from a known fine setting. However, three are from graves, one from a watery setting and one medical. And when I wrote this bit, I wasn't expecting you to be in the audience, Penny, but Penny Coombe suggests they could be used as grave goods, bathing equipment and for ritual perfuming, such as foot washing. I also found examples of foot shaped artifacts identified as an inkwell, a pestle and this holder for pens or toilet instruments, or you could put your hairpins in there, I guess. And this miscellaneous bunch of artifacts highlights the many ways Roman foot iconography occurred. One of my largest case studies was foot lamps. I've got 241 examples. They range from very tiny to life size. The lamps have been found across the Roman world, but only two of them are known to have been found in the UK. Foot lamps could be status of, statements of fashion implying wealth and status. They served as religious objects in temples and Lararia and symbolised many deities, sometimes more than one at a time. Deities with Chthonic roles, especially Isis, and Christianity were highly represented in the ornamentation on foot lamps. And the lamp's talismanic significance 
was enhanced by some of the added symbols such as Medusa's masks and phallic symbols like the one on the back of the head of this lamp here. As both lights and shoes, and because of their apotropaic qualities and religious associations, foot lamps were often included in burials. Um, foot, lamps, foot lamps seem to have been particularly valued by the Roman army who helped to spread the design. My final case study was shoe brooches or sandal fibulae, which are the most common type of skeuomorphic fibula. And I've got a corpus of 421, which are found widely in the Northwestern provinces, Switzerland and Austria, Austria, but not very often around the Mediterranean. However, there are two in the museum in Split, which I'm hoping to see <laughs> in the spring. And they date from the late first to the early third century. So I put together a typology, which is based on that one proposed by Hella Eckhart and Alex Groom. Um, the most common ones are the type ones, the least common ones, the type fours, there's only four of those that I know of, and they are all from the British Isles. The unenameled ones, the earliest ones from the late first century. Complete examples range between 21 and 52 millimetres in length. It can be difficult to tell whether they're left or right feet. I tweeted a photo of the orange brooch top left and asked if people thought it was left or right. I received 51 replies, 24 said right, 24 said left, and three couldn't tell. In my corpus, I have one brooch that represents a pair and two sets that were found as pairs. Shoe brooches, as you can see, are usually decorated with stylized Roman hobnailing depicted by means of various decorative techniques that developed in the areas where the brooches are found and that are regional rather than Roman. They come from a range of fine settings, um, but mostly urban where the markets were. Shoe brooches have many levels of meaning, novelty badges, fashionable dress accessories, love tokens, tokens of journeys, apotropaic amulets, grave goods, and religious offerings. And I'd like to finish by having a look at some of my favorite Roman shoe-shaped artifacts that sum up the many layers of meanings that can be represented by such objects. So this pair of glass oil flasks came from a third century woman's burial in Cologne. And they may be just a bit of fun, demonstrating a sense of humor. They may also have provided protection on the final journey and fashionable un hobnailing would have enhanced the apotropaic effect. This style of sandal is often worn by goddesses, so they could represent a goddess. They could signify the femininity of the deceased, since this, woman, this is a woman's style of sandal and a spindle, a woman's tool, was included in the burial. The flasks may have contained oils to anoint the dead or for ritual purification, and they may symbolize the comfort and luxury of Roman bathing which involved oils and the wearing of sandals like this. We can't say that Roman foot-shaped artifacts had one meaning, but we can say that there are several recurring themes of significance. This ranges from witty novelty objects through fashionable items to artifacts appropriate for religious, funerary and other ritual activities. They could stand in place of a person, act as a signature and be symbols of power and status. They were also used apotropaically, especially on a journey, whether that be actual travel, the journey through life, or to the underworld. It is clear that feet and footwear held a special place in the ideology of the Roman world. Thank you for listening. <laughs>